Are you guys excited for tonight? I can sense an energy. I can sense an energy, and, and I thank you for, for that because um, it's been a busy week, but God is so good to us, is He not? I'm going to pull up my notes here since uh, mine are a little different from what I give back here. We've been talking about the good fight, and today is our next to last um, session. Next week, we won't have teaching. We're going to have, um, we're going to have baptisms. And I, I just want to take a few moments and encourage you to be baptized if you haven't been baptized and gone through believer's baptism. What well, we study here at Foundation, and you know what's so interesting? Um, I'd never heard of another church called Foundation. But then again, um, I don't know if there was one. But maybe someone's been encouraged by us, because now someone told me there's another one down in, I, don't, I forget where, uh, Brother Dale was telling me, and then there's another down in the valley, and, and uh, I thought, wow, praise God, Amen. Praise God, because God gave us that name, and we're called Foundation because we, we believe in His Word, and we build our lives upon His Word. And the Bible says that, you know, the, the, the foundation of the church was laid by the lives of the prophets, apostles, and Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Amen. And so I just want to share with you kind of what God's Word says about baptism. Baptism is a holy ordinance of the church. It brings you into fellowship with the rest of the family. And we've been talking about family in the first service, I mean, excuse me, on Sunday morning. And that's how you come into the family of God when you are baptized by the Holy Spirit at, at salvation. But then, the, but then Jesus says, I want you to be physically baptized because I want you to connect what I did for you in the spiritual when you go through that baptismal pool and that water and you feel that water rush over you, I want you to always remember that I washed you white as snow. Amen. Not only did I wash you white as snow, I gave you a new life. The old you is dead, the new you now lives. And that's why the Apostle Paul says we're buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Not the old life, a new life. And so... The Bible's very specific that you cannot get into heaven on your daddy's faith, your grandma's faith, or grandma's faith. You've got to get into heaven with your personal relationship, you and God. And so many times people ask me, Pastor, does it count that my parents baptized me? I said, of course it counts. Of course it counts. It doesn't count for salvation, but it does count that parents say, I dedicate my child to the Lord. How many of you dedicate your children to the Lord? We all should dedicate our children to the Lord. I dedicated all of my three. But at some point, those children grow up. And it's no longer my responsibility. At some point, it's their responsibility. And they have to stand before God and say, Lord, mom and dad did a good job. But from here on out, it's you and I, Lord. And so what you see in the New Testament is called believer's baptism. It's when you stand on your own faith, no one else's, and you say, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. And so if you decide to get baptized, you're going to hear a very important question that I ask. And I've only had one person answer no. It was priceless. That little girl was so sweet. She's just like, no. I said, I love you. I gave her a big hug, but she didn't get baptized that day. You know why? Because baptize, uh, baptism is a personal thing between you and God. I just get to share it kind of like a, like, like a minister when he marries a couple. He's not going to get married with them. He just shares that moment, but it's their love. And that's what it is. It's you and Jesus' love. So I'll ask you a very important question. I'll say, have you accepted Jesus Christ? as your Lord and Savior? Have you trusted him as your Lord and Savior? And then you get to the answer for everyone to hear, yes, or you can say like that little girl, no. And if you say no, then you will have gotten wet, but you won't get baptized, amen? So I'm gonna ask you, if you've never gone through believer's baptism, 
where it's you and Jesus and it's your decision, I'm going to ask you to sign up tonight. Come on, let's encourage anyone who might need to sign up tonight. Let's get signed up for Believer's Baptism. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. All right, the good fight, prayer and worship. Last week we said we needed to prepare what? Spiritually and psychologically. Why do we need to prepare spiritually and psychologically? Because if we don't, then we're liable to faint. What do I mean by we're liable to faint? There's a lot of things coming at us, aren't there? I mean, this world is changing like never before. There's challenges that are gonna, that are gonna test your faith. And if you're not prepared spiritually, then you're gonna, get, you're gonna get off balance. And when you're off balance, when you're fearful, you can be manipulated. Did you know that? I truly believe that's what happened during COVID. They, they, um, and, and I'm not just saying that, I'm saying the enemy got all of, all the whole world so wrapped up in fear People were not thinking straight. How many of you think better now than you did during? Oh, it's always easier after, but what if we had prepared before? But how do you prepare for something like that? That's why I said prepare spiritually and psychologically, because you have to be strong and you have to determine, Lord, at the end of the day, I'm going to hold my faith. I'm going to keep my peace. I'm going to walk in joy. My confidence will be in you. And so we talked about this because there's a lot of things coming towards us, is there not? Now, we, we showed the timeline. We're in the middle of the church age, but we have the rapture coming. We have the rise of the Roman Empire. We have the rise of an antichrist spirit that is sweeping through the land. I'm going to put my gum out because my wife's looking at me like, you shouldn't have done that. But the Antichrist spirit is already in the earth. Did you know that? Some say, no, 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 no. The Antichrist hasn't shown up yet. I don't know if he's shown up yet or not. He hasn't been revealed. But the spirit will precede him. And the spirit will begin to move and align and orchestrate things. And we talked a little bit about that last week. Over the next eight weeks, I'm going to give you more and more and more indications of what's going on. You say, Pastor, are you trying to you trying to shake our cage, rattle us, and, and make us fearful? No, I'm trying to do the opposite. I want you to have your eyes wide open so that when you see the things coming, it doesn't catch you off guard by surprise and you don't react. You've already prepared. Spiritually, psychologically, in prayer, with worship, you know that God has you and greater is he who is within you than he who is in the world. And I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able. Some of you are going, what? Yeah, I was raised Baptist, and so half of what I quote is from hymns. The good old hymns. It was interesting today, we had, a, we, had, um, we had the funeral, and we had a congregational hymn, and we didn't have the, the, the lyrics up on the screen, and everybody was like, mm. I said, oh, here we go. This is where I get to shine. Because that's why I was raised as a PK. I know a little bit about the hymns. and Well, I love singing those hymns. Amen. And that's what I mean by preparing. You need to prepare some good songs for your soul. We've been talking about prayer and worship. So grab you some songs that you really like and don't let go of them. One of the things that I do... Uh, have as a critique against the modern worship movement is we, we sing a song and then it gets old and my kids are the world's worst because they're so young and they can remember songs like nothing. Come on, how many of you notice that once you get past 40, it's like you can't remember lyrics anymore? Hey, if you're under 40, don't laugh. Your time's coming. If Jesus doesn't show up, your time's coming and then you'll make up lyrics and your, par- and your kids will laugh at you and say, how do you not remember lyrics? Well, guess what? When I was like 20, I could remember all the lyrics. And some would say, like, you got a photographic memory. I could go to class. I'd, I'd listen to a lecture one time and I could pass the test. Why? Because I had this great memory, but things start to go. So you better prepare ahead of time and start realizing, you know, the more stressful the situation is, the more you forget. So I better get some good hymns, some good songs that I like to sing that resonate in my heart, that bring God glory and line me out in faith. Amen. Amen. We're never going to finish because that was not in the notes. (laughs) And, uh, but we're talking about birth pains. We talked about apostasies, wars, wor- uh, apostasy, 
You say, what is apostasy? It's a falling away. People losing their faith. Wars and rumors of wars and famine and pestilence and earthquakes and natural disasters, tribulations, the gospel being preached in all the earth. Can I get an amen? amen. The gospel is being preached. But I want to remind you of our focal passage for the entire series, and it's in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, how? A living sacrifice. Now watch the word he uses right after that. Holy. This is important because so many times we think, oh Lord, when that day comes, will I be able to die for you? And some of our guys, I have to speak to you for a minute. Come on, we're always ready to die for our girl. In a sense, we kind of think that way. We're like, man, if something were to happen, I'm going to jump in that front of that bullet, you know. I, I, how many of you grow up on Don't Take the Girl? You know, some of you are going, I have no idea what song that is. You just showed your age if you don't know um, that you're young. That's what you showed. But we're like, don't take the girl, right? No, I'll, do, I'll give myself up for my girl. But, but how many of you understand that it's a lot harder to live for your family than it is to die for them? I mean, how many opportunities have you really had to die for your family? None. None. But you get, you get an opportunity every moment of every day to live for them. That's the same way it is with Christ. We get an opportunity every single moment, every circumstance, every situation that unfolds to live for Christ. How so? When that person cuts us off, when we lose our temper, when we have these tough situations, we get to live for him. And how are we to live for him? As a sacrifice, that means it's going to be hard. We've got to, it's going to cost us something. Sacrifice is not sacrifice without a cost. But more importantly, it's going to cost holiness. So when we live holy, we fear the Lord, it impacts our prayer and our worship. See, someone said, Pastor, you didn't spend a whole lot of time with talking about the ins and outs and the particulars of how to pray and how to worship. You know what I've found? I have found that if you get serious about holiness and a fear of God hits you, you won't have to have anyone teach you how to worship or how to pray because the Holy Spirit will naturally get you doing it. It just comes naturally. Uh, you don't have to teach a child how to laugh and have joy. They naturally will begin to have joy and, and, in, and, and experience it, and it's the same way. And so what I'm talking about is this. I want you day in and day out to be thinking, Lord, and I want you to say this prayer, God in heaven, give me the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Because if you give me the spirit of the fear of the Lord, then I'm going to want to please you more than I want to please anyone else. And I will do, I will displease any and everyone before I displease you. Because you are my priority. You are my king. And when we have a fear of the Lord, then God begins to share his wisdom with us. He begins to share his word with us. His word starts to come alive and worship comes pouring out. And sincere, powerful prayer happens. Write that down. Sincere, powerful prayer. You know, the sincere heart is so hard to have. A sincere heart, not a selfish heart. Because at the end of the day, our prayers need to be faith-filled and full of love. Faith and love. This is why the prophet Isaiah said things like this. Therefore, the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and they honor me with their lips. What does he mean? Come on, let's put it in our common everyday vernacular. What is he saying? They talk a lot. They got a good talk game, right? But their talk is cheap. Why is it cheap? Well, watch. But they have what? Removed their hearts far from me. Their lips honor me, but their heart is hard towards me. They don't love me with their hearts. And their fear toward me is taught... By the commandment of men. 
And so what is, the, what is he saying? He's saying, hey, if you're going to honor the Lord and really sincerely pray and sincerely worship, it has to be from the heart. And Jesus said, you can say you love me all day long, but if you don't obey and try to walk in holiness, you don't love me. And so we got, we're talking about this. Why? Because the Lord is coming back, and I truly, truly believe that as a church, we need to prepare for his return. We need to prepare for his return. I asked you last week to go have a come to Jesus moment with your Lord and to say, Lord, am I ready to meet you? If you come tonight or sometime this week, am I ready to meet you? How did it go? How did it go? You know what? It's going to be beautiful. You know why? Because the Lord wants you to have that conversation. He desires to draw close to you. The Bible says that when you draw close to the Lord, he will draw close to you and the enemy flees. Think about it. Think about it. When you draw close and you give God your heart and you start having these conversations with him, he wants to draw close to you. And not only that, the enemy has to go because God is impressive and awesome and strong and he's big like that, awesome and great like that. And the enemy can't hang around that. And so if you want the enemy to scram from your life, then bring God close. Bring him and make him the centerpiece of your home. Amen? See, he taught us how to pray. And I'm going to cover this really quickly, but I am going to cover it. The model prayer is so simple because it's meant to be understood. And I won't make it hard. We're going to cover the five P's. I believe there are five. Five P's of prayer Related to the model prayer. Are you ready? The Lord's Prayer says, in this manner, therefore, pray. So Jesus says, I want you to pray in this format. Or in like manner. In, I give you an example. Doesn't mean you have to pray the model prayer, but I will tell you this. The more I pray it in sincerity, the more breakthrough I get. You say, Pastor, you've been a Christian for how long now? For as long as I can remember, and I'm... I'm going back to the simple prayer itself and just saying it throughout my day. And I can't tell you how, how impactful that has been. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Notice he's praying for needs, not greeds. What's the difference between a need and a greed? Come on, your children don't know this difference. Because I, I can't tell you how many times children or, or young people or young you know, kids come up and go, but I really need it. They said, no, 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 there's a difference between a need and a, I call it a greed. Because <laughs> it rhymes. There's a need, that this is without it, you will die. With this, or without it, you won't die, right? Some of you are going, Pastor, that's harsh. Well, no, our, our kids don't, have, don't, don't need anything. They, they're, they're, they're well taken care of. You go, Pastor, but what does that mean for us? I think so many times we spend too many times talking about our greeds to the Lord rather than our needs. And if we talked about our needs, and, and if you think about it, God is super good at bringing it back down to the basics. This is why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom. If you seek me first, then other things iron themselves out, but seek me first. Sometimes I get confused and I start seeking the other things and try to work my way back down to the kingdom, and I never quite get back down to the foundation. Why? Oh, because the enemy would just keep bringing up different things. And before long, I'm chasing my tail. And so he says here, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation. Guys, this is one of the most profound statements in all of Scripture. I can't tell you how many people we counsel with that are struggling with some kind of stronghold. What do I mean by some kind of stronghold? Some kind of addiction, some place where they've opened up the door to the enemy, the enemy's come in and now they can't get him out. You need to get into spiritual prayer, spiritual warfare, and this is where it happens. It says, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from this evil. 
For thine is the kingdom. You know, it's interesting that I've always picked up that anything powerful, the enemy knows. And the enemy will try to make fun of it. You know, it's interesting because the Spider-Man movie made fun of this. Do you remember that? Where the Green Goblin comes in and Aunt B starts praying and he goes, finish it. Finish it. And he tried to make light of it. You know why he tried to make light of it? Hollywood tried to make light of it because he knows the power of that phrase. Just that simple phrase. If you're struggling with temptation, pray. Okay, let me keep going. You ready? The five Ps. Here we go. Praise. Very first, first line is about praise. Jesus starts his prayer off by giving the Father honor and glory. He deserves it, does he not? Amen. And so when you start off your prayer, start off with honor and glory. That's a praise to God. You say, Pastor, I'm having trouble because I don't feel adequate to honor the Lord in this way. You know what you can do? You can look up Psalms, uh, Psalms 1, and just start reading five Psalms a day. If you read five Psalms a day, your, your life will be overflowing with worshipful praise, honor, and glory to God. Because David accentuates that. How about number two, purpose? The very next line, verse 10, purpose. Jesus prayed that the Father's perfect will that's already accomplished in heaven would be brought down to this earth. Come on, can I get an amen? Yes. What if you prayed that way? Lord, I already know the good works you have for me. Why? Because your word declared them. Where does his word declare that? Write this down. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. Right? It is a gift from God. Therefore, don't brag. Just receive it. You are his what? Masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works that he pre-prepared for you. What if you were to pray that way with confidence and say, Lord, I know you have some good works for me today. Why? Because your word has already declared it over me. Help me, God, have the faith to walk it out. What would begin to happen in your life if you walked out that good work that God prepared for you each and every day? And so you say, Lord, let your purpose come. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom be established. I'm an ambassador of your kingdom. Come on, how many times do your prayers kind of look more like God? Um, I got all these things I want to do. Hook it up. I got some stuff on my mind. Take care of it. Lord, and God's going, wait, who's serving who? No, I'm your butler. I'm your genie. I'm your maid. I'm your, I'm your, there's a little app that you could say, it, it was, you could download, it was called My Man in India. It means they give you a personal assistant and he would do anything you needed them to do. And it was somewhere on the other side of the world. And sometimes I think we think of Jesus that way. Lord, you're somewhere... But when I get online, hook it up. Do what I ask you to do. No. He's saying, no, it's not my will. It's, you know what's interesting? Because this is the opposite of the satanic creed. Do you realize that the satanic creed is do as thy? So when we pray our will, we're actually praying more satanic than we are godlike. What did Jesus say in the garden? Not my will be done, Lord, but thy will be done. If it's up to me, I may not go to the cross, but what do you want, Lord? And the Lord said, go to the cross. Go to the cross and give yourself as a sacrifice. Number three, provision. Give me my daily bread. We talked about that, not our greeds, but our needs. How about penitence? Yes. Yes, penitence. That means repent. You know, it's interesting because a lot of Christians today are starting to say, well, you don't need to repent of anything because Jesus has already forgiven you. Yes, it's not necessarily for his sake, it's for your sake. <laughs> because the truth is, we still do some things wrong. I, had a, uh, I listened to a lot of street, pre street preachers and one street preacher says, I don't sin anymore. And then the guy goes, wait a minute, you don't sin anymore? You're telling me you don't lie? He goes, no, I don't lie, you just lied, he said. <laughs> 
And I thought, oh, how's he going to get out of that one? Well, it's not the same. He tried to say it's not the same, and he tried to backpedal. And I, look, Christians still sin, but we don't live in it. That means you're going to fall, and God's grace will forgive it, and you're already saved. He's forgiven it, but he still asks you to repent. Why? Because in the act of repentance, something changes in your heart. And the, when we repent of our sin, it reminds us not to love it. Not to love it. When you don't repent, you'll start to fall in love with your sin and you'll begin to excuse it before long. Amen? Protection. Jesus, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Let's talk about praise now. I'm going to go to the very last psalm, and it's Psalms 150. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. That's here on earth, on the face of this earth. Praise him for his mighty acts. acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Now the psalm goes on for six verses, but I want to highlight the four different things that this psalm teaches us right now. So as we finish reading it, you can, you can hear them. God orders the place of worship. Where does he order it? We'll go back to verse 1. Praise God in his, where's his sanctuary? Right here when his people are gathered. Well, the Bible says that his sanctuary is the place he goes. Yeah, but he's everywhere. No, but there's a place he said he goes. He says, I inhabit the praises of my people. He also says, where two or three gather in my name, I will be there. He says, don't forsake coming together because I want to meet with you. And so when the people come together, that's the time to praise. Do you realize we don't call this a stage? What is this called? It's a platform. Why is it a platform? Because it's made to influence. It's not made to entertain. So when Jace is up here, when Raquel is up here, when Kieran's up here, when Jonah's up here, when Evie's up here, when any of the worship leaders are up here, they're not here to entertain. They're here to influence your worship back so that we may all worship God together. Because God walks in the room. And I want you to think about this. What would your worship look like if the King of Glory walked in the room? I said that once and people started saying, oh, I would fall on my face. I would this, I would that. Then do it because he's already here. He's already here. Amen. Do it. Get on your face. But, but what about the person who cares? You're not worshiping for their sake. We're so concerned with the person next to us that we forget the one we're worshiping. Amen. And sometimes we say goofy things like, how was worship to you today? Eh, it was all right. It wasn't for you. It wasn't for you. Why are you rating it? Ah, give it an 8 out of 10. God's saying, you know, Satan got in trouble for that. He got in trouble for taking God's worship. Don't ever take God's worship. Lord, it's your worship. Amen? And so I come ready to give you my best. So watch the next one. The next one is God orders the purpose of worship. Where, where does he purpose us to do? Or how, what is the purpose of worship? Well, in verse 2, it says, praise him for his what? Mighty acts for his greatness because he's worthy of it. Amen. He's worthy of it. Now we say, uh, sometimes I'll come up and try to encourage the congregation on Sunday morning and say, has God been good enough to you or does he owe you something still? Because if he owes you, then you can act like you don't want to worship him. But if he doesn't owe you and you owe him, then bring it, baby. Bring it. Come on. Come, come with it. Amen. Now watch this. Praise him, verse 3, with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Come on, can I get somebody to dance in this church one day? You know, somebody told me the other day, Pastor, when you worship, you, you just... You just want to dance. I, I used to dance in the world. Why can't I dance for God? 
Why can't I dance for God? Amen. He's the one that put this passion in me. You know, I told the Lord, God, you're going to heal my leg and I'm going to leap for joy in the sanctuary. Leap for joy. You say, oh, pastor, I'm not a dancer. Yeah, I've seen you dance at the Cowboys game. (laughs) Don't talk too much. Because people are always telling me what they're not. And then I go watch a sporting event with them and I find out they're ex- actually exactly what they said they weren't. They celebrate, they dance, they do the jig, they do all kinds of crazy stuff. Come on, get with it for the Lord. Watch, praise him with strings, instruments, and flutes, loud cymbals, crashing cymbals. Somebody said, oh, it's kind of loud. Amen, amen, amen. You go, yeah, but well, we can, no, we can praise him softly, somberly. We can praise him any which way you feel, but praise him, amen. Now watch, here's the last one. God ordered the uh, participants of worship. What does he say at the very end of the, of the psalm? Oh, excuse me. The very end of the psalm, he says this, verse 6, let everything that has breath. Everything that lives, let him praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Wow. This is important, guys. This is important. Why? Because this world is getting crazier and crazier and crazier. And the Bible says we're called to be light. We're called to be salt. That means we're called to preserve. The Bible says that the spirit of Antichrist won't be free to do what, he, what, it's, what it's set its, its sights on doing until... The restrainer is removed. Or better way of putting it, that restrainer steps aside and allows the end time events to unfold. That restrainer is the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you and me. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says you were sealed. Sealed with what? You were sealed with the Spirit of the living God. And that Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will raise you from the dead. Or will rapture you if you're still alive and make you take flight to meet Jesus in the air. It's a remarkable thing. This thing we do. Now watch. If we're called to resist, if we're called to preserve, then we've got to have some backbone and strength. Because things are getting a little crazy. Check out this video by uh, Yuval Noah Harari. I, like I said, I, I listen to what he's talking about because they call him a modern day prophet. He's a prophet for the wrong side. Um, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. We, you know, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. Every religion claims our book, all the other books of the other religions, they, humans wrote them. But our book, no, 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 no. It came from some superhuman intelligence. In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct, that just think about a religion whose holy book is written. Just think about it. And I don't think we got enough of the clip, but that might be my fault. He goes on to say that in in very near, near, um, near future, AI will be able to write a holy book. Why? Because AI is going to be a superior intelligence. To us. And they will seem like a what? A supernatural intelligent being. That's what we call our God. He, he's supernatural, that he has a mind, that he's intelligent, that he has a will for us. And AI will write us a holy book. Because up until now, it's only been wishful thinking. We only wish that we had a real God giving us a book. No, this is an evil thing that is being spread more and more and more. I want to tell you something else. I want to share with you the, uh, the benevolent alien uh, phenomenon or doctrine that's being put forth. That we were a seed planet and these aliens are coming back to us. And they're going to they're gonna reintroduce themselves and they're going to say, hey, uh, we've been watching you from afar. I want you to know, Marvel's all over this. Oh, Disney's all over this. Every major studio is all over this concept. And they're pushing it, pushing it, pushing it to the younger generation. You know what that's called? It's called the Tower of Babel rising again. The Tower of Babel rising again. I want you to remember what I said about the Tower of Babel. Nimrod was in God's face saying, I don't need you, God. 
That's what he did. And that's what our society is doing. The Bible talks about this, if you want to go read about it, in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. Talks about the rise of Babylon again. And Babylon represents an ungodly religion, government, and economic system. They will all be melded and united together, government, religion, and economics. And virtually all unrighteousness that the end times predicts about society is derived from a Babylonian source. You can be traced back to Babylon, that it's all going to resurge. And it can be summed up in this phrase from God's word. It says, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the world. And you see this being raised again. And you say, Pastor, are you really seeing this convergence of religion, economics, and uh, and, and, uh, and, and the different aspects of, of this world? Yes. Last week I showed you that we have to, you say, well, Pastor, there's not a lot we can do about it. No. Remember I told you, get prepared. Get prepared because if the Bible says there's going to be a one world system, that this is going to be the attitude of the world and it's going that direction, then what does that tell you? Come on, let's just use logic. If God says this is the end, this is where, then you know that Jesus is coming back if all the pieces are being put in place. If all the pieces are being put in place and there's not a whole lot we can do about it, you say, we, you're right, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. You know what you can do? You can be prepared because Jesus said it's going to happen. What's going to happen is I'm going to come for you. I'm going to come for you. So make sure you're ready. But what do I do in the meantime? I prepare and I live like he could come tonight. But what about my business? Everything you do, do it to the honor and glory of God. When you cut your grass, do it to the honor and glory of God. When you eat, do it to the honor and glory of God. Do everything you do to the honor and glory of God, but prepare your heart. Don't leave that to the end. Do that first and be ready for your king. Watch, I'm going to show you another video because um, this idea of uh, the government, religion, and economics is converging faster than you think. Term implications of that. Tell us why you're so troubled about some of the activities at the World Health Organization. So in my opinion, the World Economic Forum and the United Nations are using the World Health Organization or in order to trap us in a digital gulag. And what the reason that they're using the World Health Organization is because studies have shown that you can instill great fear through people's fear about health, fear about death, and fear is what paralyzes people's minds and it gets them to be compliant. So the World Health Organization is currently negotiating two instruments. Now, I want to say I think that these are treaties because they affect our national sovereignty, but the World Health Organization will not call them treaties because they're trying to subvert the U.S. treaty process and the treaty process all over the world. So don't think that this won't happen because it won't pass our Senate. If they get their way, our Senate will never see it. And so these two instruments, one is amendments to the international health regulations. The other one is a pandemic agreement, which I will call a treaty. And between the two of those, they are setting a trap, a digital gulag, which will include mandatory digital IDs that will be interoperable all over the world, which means that all the information that's on your ID will be able to be seen by any country, including China. It establishes a surveillance system, and they're using health as the excuse for this, or the pretext for it, uh, where they're going to be surveilling not only human health, this is another thing, they've got this one health concept, human health, animal health, plant health, the environment, and what it does is it gives them the, the ability to surveil any aspect of life on Earth. Then they have um, something that they're negotiating about censorship. So the parties to the agreement, which would be the countries, are, would be agreeing to censor misinformation and disinformation. So through social listening, that's, one, that's what they say. So what they're going to be doing is monitoring our social media accounts. Who knows if they'll even be monitoring our phones, monitoring our email. Social listening could include that. To, to determine whether we are saying things that are counter narrative to what the WHO is trying to say. And you know what? The WHO has so bungled 
the COVID-19 debacle saying things that, that were disinformation, like the WHO parroted what China was saying. This is, you know, there's no human to human transmission. The vaccines are safe and effective. They prevent transmission and infection. And all of these things have been shown to be false. So they were the main purveyors of misinformation and disinformation, but they will censor and probably do worse things, you know, shut us off from our credit cards and bank accounts if we counter what they're, the message that they're trying to get out. Yeah, Reggie, it sounds like what you're describing, and even more importantly, what they are describing, is a one world government. And you've written that humanity stands on the brink of enslavement uh, to this kind of system. Is the U.S. under the current government rushing headlong into this great reset? The, the clip goes on. I'm going to stop it there because he said, yes, we are. Let me give you another um one of the things that our current government, not just this, this administration, but the last few administrations have been doing, they've been, they've been uh, perverting the process of, of due process, of uh, separation of powers. And what do I mean by that? This Green New Deal that they're moving ahead with, it's never gone through our legislative system. It's never gone to the Senate, never gone to the House, never had any voting on it. How are they doing it? They're just adopting it at the executive level. Uh, putting the cabinet members in place, saying, this is what you're called to do, this is what our nation is doing, go enforce it through our agencies and our different departments, and we're going to enact everything by, um, by executive order. That's not the way we're called to do it. And I don't know if you called, caught it there, the, the WHO is not going to put a formal treaty because a treaty would require nations to vote on it. But there's already legislation that is being that has already gone through. It was in the past uh, the, one one of the big uh, relief bills that said anything that goes through the WHO we will abide by. And so we have to be careful with this. You go, well, Pastor, what can we do? At least you can prepare your heart and prepare your mind, prepare your soul. Christ is coming. Yeah. Why? How do you know? How can you be so sure? Well, think about this. Never before in the history of the world have we reached this point. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He caused all, both small, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Do you realize that this, um, this digital ID, this world digital ID that they're, that they're pushing forth, you say, yeah, but first we got to come up with CBDCs and this and that. Fed now is already being tested. That's the U.S.'s CBDC, digital currency, is being tested right now. They're going to start rolling it out softly in July of this. Oh, that's like next month. Snap! That's next week. So, so this is happening a lot faster than you think. And, and you say, but, but is that it? Is that it? No, no, no. That's the system that's being put in place. Then once the system in place, then the man of perdition shows up and says, hey, guess what? I'm your savior. But you need to worship me too. And so we have to be careful with this. So you say, but pastor, if the system is being put in place, all I'm asking you to do is be logical. And this is something that people aren't very good at these days. I see videos on TikTok, not TikTok, what's the, what's the deal I watch? The, the Instagram and, uh, I'm so, I feel so old, the Instagram. <laughs> Instagram and shorts, the, the little YouTube shorts. Where people talk, like, I'll give you one example. There's this guy, and he's, I mean, he's just talking. He goes, uh, you know what? Uh, he's talking to a radio host, and he, and he says, you know, I'm not in favor of abortion. However, it's a woman's right to choose. And if a woman wants to take a child all the way to the ninth month, but at the ninth month changes her mind and, and wants to abort that child, she should be allowed to do it. And the, and the, and the host is saying, whoa, whoa, time out. That's horrible. That's this. That's that. There's so many different options. You can take this child to a, uh, a fire station, a post office. You can do so many good things with this. No, 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 no. And he says, okay, okay, okay. What if she takes meth? And he says, he says, well, that's not right. And then he goes, why wouldn't that be right? Because she's deliberately trying to kill the, babe, the child. Oh. 
And then he looks like, and the guy goes, well, wait a minute. The, the radio host goes, wait a minute. He goes, <laughs> like it finally hit him. I'm like, we don't know how to be logical anymore. We don't know how to stay on track and be logical and say it's both killing. They're both killing the child. You know, it's not right. So, so watch, this is what I'm saying. How, how do you be logical in this situation? You understand that if everything's going in place, then we have to live with a heartbeat for our king's return. Our heart has to start pounding for his return. Come on, you remember when you were first getting married? That day before I got married, oh my goodness. Oh man, I had to sing. You want to put pressure on a groom, have him sing. Jace, I don't have your voice. So it was, it was like, whoa. But I was going for it. So watch, where am I at? Uh, to receive the mark on the right hand or the forehead. Oh, I forgot to tell you. So this system is going to involve biometric scanning. You'll scan your, your palm and you'll scan your retina. Isn't that interesting? And that no one may buy, sell, except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of the beast. Here is wisdom. Let he, let he who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is 666. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. You say, Pastor, but this is Jesus telling his disciples that you will see the abomination that causes desolation. But, but he, he points you back to Daniel. Daniel talks about more than just that one act. Says there will be a small prince, a prince of this world that will rise. That's the Antichrist. You will know who he is when he commissions a seven-year treaty with Israel. There's all sorts of stuff happening in the Middle East right now. Even a potential coup attempt in Russia this past week. Nuts! The Wagner group that are, that are prisoners that had been released to fight for Russia were the ones marching on Moscow to, to, uh, to basically perform a coup d'etat against Vladimir Putin. All of a sudden they stop. They turn around and they make nice, like everything's okay. What they didn't tell you is they marched through several military esta uh, establishments or bases, one of which holds 140 to 200 nukes, and they had it completely under their control. Something big is happening, and you start paying attention. Why? So that our heart can beat for our king. And not only that, but there's all sorts of talk of taking humanity to the next level. I, I want to show you this, this next video because I think this is really, really interesting. And I want to tell you something else. This is happening in Saudi Arabia. Many prophetic scholars believe that the Antichrist could come from that region of the world because many believe that he will be of Assyrian descent. Assyrian descent. Now, uh, watch this. For too long, humanity has existed within dysfunctional and polluted cities that ignore nature. Now, a revolution in civilization is taking place. Imagine a traditional city and consolidating its footprint, designing to protect and enhance nature. The line will be home to 9 million residents and will be built with a footprint of just 34 square kilometers and we are designing it to provide a healthier, more sustainable quality of life. The Lines communities are organized in three dimensions. Residents have access to all their daily needs within five minute walk neighborhoods. And the Lines infrastructure makes it possible to travel end to end in 20 minutes with no need for cars, resulting in zero carbon emissions. By leveraging AI technology, services are autonomous, saving you time and effort. Designed by world-leading architects, the line is 500 meters tall, 200 meters wide, 170 kilometers long, and housed within an elegant mirror glass facade. Intelligent solutions create efficiency 
and year-round temperate microclimate with natural ventilation. Energy and water supplies are 100% renewable. The line is designed as a series of unique communities, offering a wealth of amenities, providing equitable views and immediate access to the surrounding nature. With 40% of the world accessible within six hours, at the heart of the globe's key trade routes, a place for commerce and communities to thrive like nothing on earth seen before. The Line, the city that delivers new wonders for the world. Look, I'm not against advancement. That sounds pretty cool to me. I, I might visit on a vacation type scenario if they can prove that it works, but it can also become a prison real quick. I've been in Houston in the projects and, you know, when they first painted that picture, it was pretty like that. And it turned out to be something horrific. You know, so uh, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, it looks like a, a, a modern day Tower of Babel on its side. God toppled the last one, so they just figured, let's just start with it on the side. Because, you know, he's liable to come down and do the same thing to the, so um, I think that's funny. Anyway, let's keep going. Um, the truth of the matter is, we must ground our, our life in real strength of prayer and worship. Like it's go time for Christians to begin praising and worshiping their king because he's coming back. And as that happens, something supernatural will begin to take place inside of us and in our midst. After all, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, the Bible says, but against principalities. If you haven't seen the movie Nefarious, I would, ex I would say go see it. If you're squeamish about, you know, kind of those kind of movies, uh, maybe don't see it, but it's definitely a Christian movie. And uh, there's a little scene in the movie Nefarious where they're talking about fighting. I'm, I'm going to play it for you, and, and then we'll it'll explain it. Ready for round two? I didn't know this was a fight. That's why you're losing. I apologize for losing my professional demeanor. Did you catch that? It was a beautiful clip. I guess it didn't show it all there. But, but they're sparring. They're going, I mean, and this, this guy is demon-possessed. Not him. He's the lawyer. I mean, he's the doctor in the scene, but the other guy's demon possessed, and he's convinced, trying to convince him that he is a demon called Nefarious, an ancient demon, and, and he says, are you ready for round two? And the guy says, I didn't know we were fighting. He says, that's why you're, I think too many Christians don't know we're fighting, and the enemy's saying, that's why I'm kicking your tail. We wrestle not against each other, but against principalities, against powers, rulers of this dark age, against the spiritual host of wickedness, where? In the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, put on a breastplate of righteousness. I want to highlight those things. Truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace. What is the gospel of peace? The gospel of peace is this, that Jesus Christ came to us who are sinners and he called us to what? Repent and believe. And when I repented and believed, everything changed. That's power. What does it give you power to do? To stand. You can't move me. Why? Because I have these, these spiritual cleats. The, the, the Roman soldiers used to have cleats on their, sh on their shoe gear. Why? So that they could hold their ground. You're called to hold your ground. Watch what else he says. Above all, take up the shield of faith. That means you've got to build your faith. This is why it's so important for us not to operate out of fear, but to say, I already know this stuff's coming. My pastor's been telling me for years now. My faith is secure. It's sure. Jesus, come quickly. I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready. Oh, but what if it gets bad? What if it gets dark? What if it gets this? Greater is he who is within me. You know, I don't fear the one that can kill my body. I fear the one that can kill my soul. I fear God. Amen. And my soul is secure in his hand. Watch this. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. But watch verse 18. Most people miss verse 18. 
Praying always with what? All prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So you have this gear for close combat, but then you have prayer to shoot some artillery over the wall, so to speak, over to your neighbor's house. You say, what are you going to be shooting your neighbor with? No, you got to pray for your neighbor. Let's say, Lord, I pray for them. I pray your peace upon their life. I pray your peace upon my children. I pray your peace upon all my family members. I pray that you would draw them to you, Lord. I pray that you would open their eyes, my King. I pray that you would speak to them. I pray that you would start to unfold your good work for them, Lord. I pray beyond just me, myself, and I. Amen? This is what we're talking about here. So stay with me. We're almost done. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What does it mean, not carnal? It means they are not of this world. They're not physical. They're not fleshly. They are spiritual in nature, and they're for a very specific reason. Watch. But they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Therefore, if you have a stronghold, have a brother come and pray with you that that stronghold would fall in Jesus' name. You say, how do I do that? Well, the Bible says very, very plainly that we've been given authority. Now, we're talking about power and authority, right? The Bible says, well, you will receive power, and I give you authority to go forth and establish my kingdom, Jesus said. So how do I do that? Well, when I pray for a brother, I pray and I take authority according to God's word. Your word says, Lord, that we have the authority to bind, to bind, to tear down, to cancel, call it null and void. Alcoholism, let it be gone in Jesus' name. The spirit of, of, of pornography and an addiction to pornography, in Jesus' name, let it be broken. Let it be broken and I loose peace and joy. I loose a heart of Job that he would make a covenant with his eyes not to look at a young woman or any woman with lust. That's God's word. Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. And so I loose God's word in her life. Well, can I do that? Of course you can do that. You're a son of the most high God. You're a daughter of the most high God. Because that's what you've been given the spiritual armament for. Casting down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all this. Oh, what a, whoa, 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 pastor, punish. Not physical. He just said our weapons are not physical. You're not going to go and start punishing your brother. No, you're going to punish the evil spirits that have been tormenting and running amok in people's lives. You're going to bring them into obedience and you're going to remove them from people's lives. Amen? Okay. I'm warning you, there's a time coming where people will be lovers of themselves. There's going to be doctrines of demons floating about everywhere. It's going to be a selfish and controlling society. Selfish and controlling society. It's right there in God's word. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now watch this verse, verse right here. This is very powerful. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Why do you think I came against Pastor Stanley so strong? Form of godliness, but the Holy Spirit doesn't have the, the power to change someone from homosexuality? Oh, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Quit, the, quit insisting that someone be free from pornography. They're human. No. I'm going to insist the Holy Spirit meant to make you free. His word says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Yeah, we have a form of godliness, but we deny its power. Don't buy that nonsense. Because that nonsense will have you believing that Jesus isn't strong enough to overcome this world and rescue you. And he is. He is. I realize there's going to be, there's going to be, 
in the last days, people that will depart from the faith. It's right there in 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4 says, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, in the last days, what? Some will depart from the faith. In another verse, it says many will depart from the faith. Do not get discouraged. You hold your faith. You pray for your family. You gather your family up. You preach the word in season and out of season. You make sure you're safe and secure. There's going to be a lot of people falling away to all sorts of nonsense. You see it every day. It's like every day there's another belief system that somebody's peddling. And Jesus said, they're going to say, there's the Christ. He's out there. He's over here. They're going to try to convince you of different things. It's right there, but watch what he calls it. They will give heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons. It's demonic. If it's against this word, it's demonic. How do I know if it's against the word, pastor? You need to tell me. You need to read. Can I tell you one of the greatest doctrines of demons, and I'm on this, I'm on it because God won't let me rest on it, is this, is this demonic spirit of abortion. We're honoring the God of Moloch and Baal that would receive the blood of our children through the ages. You say, oh, pastor, are you sure? I want you to, I want you to read some of the quotes from Margaret Sanger, the, the founder of Plant Parenthood. And you tell me if this is a virtuous, godly woman that started this evil organization. Read it with me. The most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infant members is to This does not represent the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. God says, I want your family to what? Multiply. I want you to be blessed. I want you to fill the earth. Come on, how many of you come from a large family? How many parents come from a large family? Your parents came from a large family. My, parent, my dad came from eight. You know, God bless the mother whose womb is is. is it's fruitful, God says. That's the truth. No, let, let me share something else with you. This one really gets me, and this speaks to me. We should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities. The most successful educational uh, approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. And we don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. You want to know where they put Plant Parenthoods? They put them in my neighborhood in Houston. Largest Plant Parenthood in North America was right there off the Gulf Freeway in in. in in 3rd and 5th Ward, 2nd Ward, served that whole area. That's where we were. Why? Because they want to get rid of those, what she called weeds. Hispanic, black, anyone who wasn't upper class and privileged. This is a satanic doctrine of demons that's coming back. Full speed, strong. You say, oh, Pastor, why are you hitting it? Because I want us to stand for truth. I get it. Sometimes I feel like, well, you know, they make such a good argument. No, 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 no. Stand on God's word. Amen? Amen. Here we go. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. This is where we finish. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Instead, they'll look for preachers that tell them what they want to hear. But let no one deceive you. Jesus won't come unless the falling away comes first, is what he says to the Thessalonians. There's a choice to make. God ends up on top. It's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. This is where I finish. I'll take my gum back.
I don't know why I did that. <laughs> My wife's going to let me have it tonight. <laughs> She'll be like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, hey, guys, you know the Bible says that God's going to keep, Jesus will keep us from the wrath. There is, there, there's a battle coming. You don't have to worry. You just have to prepare your heart, get your eyes focused right. You say, but pastor, I've got a lot of things to do in the meanwhile. Keep doing them. But don't forget. Don't forget. Because it's easy for humans to forget, right? And you don't want to be caught unaware. When, when the trumpet starts to sound, you want to be like, I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Let's do this, God. Let's do it. Amen. Your thought doesn't need to be, oh, what are my children doing? Oh, are they going to? No, my children are ready. Let's do this together. Amen? Amen? You go, well, what do I do? You pray. You pray for them. God answers prayers. God answers prayers. Well, Pastor, I, I, um, I'm having trouble. Um, what, what, what do you think? So, so this is what I'll send you off with. Please don't leave. I want you to, to start praying for a hunger and thirst for holiness. It's right up here. I want you to pray for the spirit of the fear of the Lord and a deep abiding conviction that Jesus is returning soon. What does that mean? I mean, Lord, let my heart begin to pound. I want to I wanna feel it in my bones that you're coming back soon. I don't want to be lethargic. I don't want to be apathetic. I don't want to be um, distracted. I want to be focused. Okay? So then what? Well, then I, I'm going to ask you to pray salvation for your loved ones and for our community that God would bring in to our church and, and we would see a soul harvest begin to happen here in this community. And I truly believe he'll do it if you help me pray for it. And then I want you to be ready to volunteer for our, prayer, uh, our nights of prayer. Our week of fasting and prayer, I want you to stretch yourself. If you've never done a week, I want you to go for it. Do a week of fasting. How many of you think you can do it? Amen. How many of you think you can do half the week? All right, all right, good job. A day? Some of you are like, I don't know, Pastor. <laughs> we'll start you off slow, right? <laughs> How about this? 24 hours and 70 hours of prayer. We're going to be scheduling those, I'm going to ask you to do four-hour slots or do like Brother Laz and I, we did a 24-hour slot. And, and, and do a prayer time. Um, and then prayer walks. This is super important. I was talking to Gil Cervantes about this. I mean, we're going to do an old-fashioned Jericho prayer walk where we start taking ground over our, our community, <laughs> over our schools. I'm going to need you, if you have a real burden, I need you to sign up. Because I'm going to give you leadership over the schools, over Main Street, over the highway district, over the different neighborhoods. And we'll gather and organize and then we'll pray for that territory. Amen? All right, church, I love you. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless this church to your name, Lord. Let our heart pound and beat for your coming, for our bridegroom. And then, Lord... Let us hunger and thirst for holiness. That the spirit of the fear of the Lord would fall on us. In Jesus' name, amen.